elusive God, companion on the way. You walk behind, beside, beyond. You catch us unaware. Break through the disillusionment, disillusionment which sometimes clouds our vision. That with wide-eyed wonder we may find our way and journey on as messengers of your good news. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, some say that preaching should be authoritative. Preach it because you believe it to be true. And I think that's true, but I also believe that preaching done at its best comes from a place of humility and from a place of process. And I am no different than anyone else who is trying to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I am in the midst of working this thing out. I am in the midst of working out my own salvation. There are some things I will preach with authority because I believe that there is just no leeway on the topic whatsoever. But there are some things I will preach recognizing that I don't have it all figured out but that I'm seeking to follow Jesus and understand his ways along the way of figuring it out. This morning, I'm being vulnerable with you. I'm preaching out of a personal conviction, but I'm also admitting that there are more than a few ways that you could go on the particular topic which we're going to talk about today. So having said that, let's do this. We continue today through our series entitled In Communion. We're talking about the church. Who she is, where she came from, what does she do, and where is she going? And as I said last week, it only makes sense that during a series entitled In Communion that we actually spend a little bit of time talking about what takes place when we come together for communion. The title of this morning's message is Outcomes of the Table. And by the table, I mean the Lord's Supper, or Communion, or the Eucharist. Depending on the tradition with which you're most familiar, you will know this ceremony by different names. And you will have a particular theology of what happens and what is signified when we come together to do this. Well, I have grown up in the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, taking part in the Lord's Supper since I was very young, since I made that initial decision to follow Jesus. I, I grew up with a very limited knowledge of what exactly takes place when we come forward to partake in the bread and the cup, other than I knew that I was not Roman Catholic. I didn't really know what they were doing over there, and then again, I didn't really know what I was doing either, but I knew enough to know that whatever they were doing over there, that's not what I was doing here. Anyway, that's, that's, that's what it was. I took part in communion once a month, like every good Alliance person does, usually at the end of the service, usually as a bit of an addendum, if you will. There was always two or three passages of scripture read, usually from 1 Corinthians 11. It was passed out in trays, aisle by aisle, Perfectly cut individual little pieces of white bread. They're perfectly, they're, they're like play -Doh. It's fantastic. Don't judge me, because I know you've all done it. You can kind of you mold them, and you can shape them, and sometimes when the guy would pray, and pray, and pray, and you were a kid, I mean, you just flatter and flatter, and, you know, and then you'd, you'd try to see how much flex that little communion cup had, and you'd bend it and bend it. I remember once with shattered and juice all over the Anyway, don't judge me. You've all done it. And, anyway, it was very silent. Very contemplative, lots of inner reflection. It was very focused on me, on my sin, and my need for repentance. Now, I'm not really sure how to explain what happened to me, but several years ago, I began to wonder if that's all there was to communion, to the Lord's Supper, to the table. And eventually, what began with some inner questioning turned into a full scale deconstruction and reconstruction. I've read a lot of writings from the early church fathers. We talked about those guys last week. The guys that kind of were responsible for shaping much of early Christian doctrine in the first several centuries of the church. So I read a bunch of what they had to say about this event. I read some contemporary scholars on the subject. I looked at all sorts of different traditions and the ways in which different churches approach this, this thing that we do. I talked with others who are much smarter than myself. I prayed about it. I searched through scripture to try and figure out how was it talked about in the Bible. And I thought about my own experiences as I've come forward as a part of the community to partake in this. And through it all, I've started to formulate my own understanding. Now, I must tell you that this has not happened easily for me. I, I take this stuff very seriously. Primarily for two reasons. The first one is orthodoxy. I, I don't want to be a heretic. Like, trying to get this right actually matters a great deal to me. And it matters a great deal to me because I think this is really about worship. 
Worshiping God to the fullest extent of our human capability means something to me. You know, for example, it's easy to look at those church fathers. They would come together for years and years at these theological councils to wrestle about issues of theology and doctrine and the faith. And it would be easy to look at them and say, well, they're just a bunch of theology geeks. They were just into that. I think it was about a month ago, Pastor Steve was up here talking about theology geeks, and he said that they deserve to have wedges. Which, by the way, was just his way of trying to distance himself from being the very thing that he is, which is a theological geek. So I think it would be more than appropriate that when he returns, we all get a hold of those undies and raise them to the roof. So let's remember that come September time. And we'll, you know, we'll bring them up. It'd be great. We'll hang them on a the microphone. Yeah. Anyway, it'd be easy to look at those church fathers and say, well, it's just, they're just into theology. No, it was not about that. As you read those guys, you start to realize they were so captivated by the person of God that to not express him in the most appropriate way possible was for them a problem. They weren't just fighting, fighting heretics and heresies, though they were. They were trying to articulate what it meant to worship God. I hope you believe me this morning when I say that is my aim. I'm not just trying to make a point here. I'm not just trying to challenge you. I'm not just trying to make you think about something in a way that maybe you haven't thought about it before. I want to know the person of God. And it's my prayer for us that together as a community, we would know the person of God. At a minimum, at a bare minimum, I hope at least this morning that what we talk about makes you ask yourself the question, what do I actually believe? about what takes place here when we all come forward to partake in the bread and the cup. Luke 24, uh, verses 13 to 35 is our passage for today. And uh, if you've got your electronic device or your Bible, get that thing open up to Luke 24, 13 through 35, because, you know, by all means, fact check me along the way. Let's, uh, you know, kind of get involved with the scripture as we walk through this. It'll be on the screen as well. Here's some background info for what's going on. Jesus has just been crucified. But three days prior to this story, he has been nailed to a cross by the Roman Empire. So Jesus, in the minds of everybody out there, is dead. But we know the story. He is actually alive. But the people we're going to read about think that he's dead. So we catch up with a couple of Jesus' disciples, or should I say, these are guys who were disciples of Jesus, but now think that the Savior is no more. He's been crucified on the cross. And so we pick up with the story in verse 13. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had just happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey, but they were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All of these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had said. They didn't see him either. Then Jesus said to them this great line, You foolish people. Your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them, remember, they still don't know who this is. Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. It was obviously a long walk. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's near the evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. 
They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? Then they got up, they got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven, the other disciples of Jesus, and the companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. Now, we are enlightened, smart, scientific, educated, not into hocus pocus kind of people. The ability to reason is a high priority and goal for us as 21st century citizens. Now, sadly, I think our movement towards those things has done much to kill the mysterious wonder of the God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The supernaturalness of God is hard for us to grasp, dare I say, even to believe in. The text says that Jesus was with them on the road, but that they didn't recognize him. I mean, how can that be? He clearly must have been wearing his white gown and blue sash. I mean, how could they not have known it was him? The disciples on the road, by the way, in the first service, nobody even chuckled at that, so. <laughs> Good for you guys, I guess. Uh, the disciples on the road were unable to tell that this person was Jesus. In a remarkably mysterious way, they were blinded to his very identity. Now, what's interesting about the text is that Jesus apparently didn't want them to see him in the old-fashioned way, by seeing him with their eyes. It seems to me that Luke 24 is a paradigm for the New Testament church, the church that would continue to exist and function after Jesus has ascended to heaven. The two travelers are us, a people who would know Jesus without actually seeing his physical body. Are, are you with me so far? Is that making sense? This is the first time followers of Jesus are having to deal with a Jesus who's not actually physically present with them. Which I think begs a very important question. How do we, how do we, the church today, experience the person of Jesus Christ now that his earthly body has left us? How do we experience Jesus now that he has ascended to the right hand of the Father? Well, the meaning of the word sacrament is a means of grace, a means of experiencing divine grace. But when we're talking about a unique way in which we might experience God, we can call that thing or that moment, that time, that place, a sacrament. There, there are certain spaces and moments in time where we acknowledge the uniqueness of God's mysterious presence that is with us, changing us, challenging us, and transforming us, demonstrating His grace for us. These moments are sacramental moments. This text, I believe, goes a long way in teaching us about a couple of specific sacraments. The first sacrament within this text is the spoken word. Biblical preaching. The disciples in this text that we just read about didn't know it was Jesus, but his teaching changed and challenged them. The text says that the scriptures set their hearts on fire, that Jesus teaching them through the word set their hearts on fire. Jesus read from and he taught them the meaning of scriptures and it subsequently transformed them. The power of Scripture is that because God uses it, because it contains God's inspired message, message and teaching, that it has the power to bring us face to face with the God of the universe and subsequently transform us because of those experiences. You've all probably had those moments where somebody is speaking to you through Scripture and something is changing inside of you. You are, you are encountering the very presence of God inside of you and you leave a changed person. The spirit that inspired the words on the pages of the Bible that you hold now, or that you see on the screen, is the same spirit who takes those words today through preaching and study and makes them a means of God's grace, a means of experiencing God's grace, a sacrament. Now, us Protestants are all over this. We are totally cool with good biblical preaching. The Word, the Scriptures, they are central to our theology, they're central to our churches, and they're central in many of our homes. When the Gospel is proclaimed through the preaching of Scripture, hearts burn and people's lives are changed, and this is as it should be. We have to celebrate this. This is something to be excited about. The next sacrament in this text 
is perhaps somewhat uncomfortable for some of us, perhaps old for a few of us, perhaps totally new for some of us. The second means of grace in this passage is the breaking of the bread, the table, communion. Their eyes were opened, and they saw it was Jesus only when the bread was broken and in their hands. Scripture had been read, but they only knew Jesus was with them when bread had been broken and they were holding it. Now there are some brilliant paintings, mostly from the early 17th century, which depict this incredible moment, and we're going to look at a few of them. I, I imagine that what the painters were trying to get into this was to capture that moment when the disciples realized in that instance who it was that they were sitting with and the, the sheer bewilderment of it. So if you look at the first one, this is by a guy named, and I, I, I want to pronounce it correctly, Diego Velasquez from around 1620. You can see now the kind of look of awe in the disciples' eyes as he sits there, arms raised, kind of in shock at what's going on. And now the nail hole in Jesus' hand, clearly visible, and the soft glow of the Spirit around Jesus' head, as they are just astonished at who is sitting with them in this moment. If we go to the next slide, this is a Carvaggio uh, from also the early 17th century. Now, if there are artists here, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking 10 seconds to look at a painting? You've got to be kidding me. And for the rednecks that are here with us, you're thinking, why is he making us look at art? This is the dumbest thing ever. So let's we'll try and meet somewhere in the middle there, and we'll, we'll all get along. But this is a Carpaggio. You can see again Jesus sitting there, the, tape, the, the bread broken. The two disciples in shock. I love the one guy kind of jumping back, grasping his chair in this moment. That the Savior, he's alive. He's alive. Not only is he alive, he's sitting right here with us. In the next one, also a Carvaggio, this is my favorite, if you're on my Facebook page, you can see this is my timeline picture because I just love everything that, that this story represents in my own theology, in my own life. I, and I especially like this one because Jesus looks the most normal in this one. I, I'm not a big fan when we make Jesus look like a Swedish supermodel with long flowing hair and a hood. It just doesn't work for me at all. So I, I really like the, the, just the normal Jesus. And yet, the disciples are still in shock. I, sorry, it's kind of washed out because of the light in here, but you know, the one guy sitting down here, his hands open in shock, the other guy jumping back, grasping the table. And maybe Caravaggio was Dutch, because there's this nice old lady baking bread in the background, but I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, in all of these paintings, a very familiar guest becomes a very familiar host. Jesus, who was at first the unknown guest, is now Jesus the very known host of a meal. Suddenly it's not just an intriguing stranger who could preach with power, it's the Savior himself, and the disciples are blown away by what they have just seen take place. Their eyes were open to the very presence of Jesus Christ once the bread had been broken and it was in hand. Their eyes were opened during communion. They quite literally experienced the presence of Jesus in their midst when they partook in the bread of God. So here's what I think. We must notice that for some reason, in our Protestant, Christian, and Missionary Alliance tradition, we have somehow not seen, dare I suggest, even avoided. Jesus chose to vanish not after the sermon was done, but after the bread was handed out and in hand. Now that the bread is in their hands, Jesus vanishes. His, his, his being needed in that moment is it's over, he's gone, he splits, his work in that moment finished. Now, I've heard many sermons, I've read many books, and I've even preached many sermons on how the church can and should change the world for Jesus Christ. The problem is this, the church needs a worship encounter with God that will sustain and empower her to do her thing. You see, the conclusion that I have come to is that if all we have is good biblical teaching, we don't have enough. If all we have is a good sermon, good exegesis, good breaking down the story from Scripture, then we don't have enough. There is power, grace, presence in the Lord's table celebration because it was ordained by God to empower His church, to be His church to be the very body of Jesus Christ in this world. I think, I know, that I have been sacramentally deprived. That I have been sacramentally deprived. 
We observe some sacraments within our tradition, like baptism and communion, but we don't believe that anything unique or spiritual or mysterious could actually take place when we celebrate those things. These practices for us are unfortunately mere signs. You know, we say that we do these things because they reflect something that's taken place on the inside. So they're just symbols of something we believe. But that we don't actually think anything mysterious takes place there. Again, I, I wonder if it's our fear of the mysterious and our propensity to reason out all things that have shaped this thinking in us. You see, sacramental Christians believe the sacraments originate with God. And he does something literal, mysterious, and profoundly unique to us when we receive and experience them. They are a gift from God, a means of divine grace, an encounter with the very person of Jesus. Now, Martin Luther, Mr. Protestant Reformation himself, taught and believed the very thing I'm suggesting. That the real, excuse me, that the real presence of Jesus surrounds the bread and cup. Now his buddy, Ulrich Zwingli, who was one of Luther's contemporaries, actually ran in the complete other direction. He said, no, 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 these are just mere symbols. Nothing special takes place here, nothing at all. Uh, which, coincidentally, is pretty much the Christian and Missionary Alliance, you know, unspoken position on this. These are just symbolic things, times for reflection, mere symbols. Then along comes John Calvin, the true politician, several years later, who taught both that real presence could exist while real absence could exist at the same time. He believed that something happens here, unique, but that it's not the very body of Christ which we consume, but that also by a wonderful, mysterious work of the Holy Spirit, during the celebration of the Lord's Supper, somehow the very presence of Jesus surrounds the meal as his church partakes in it. So real absence, because Jesus has gone to heaven, but real presence, because somehow in this moment, when we celebrate these things, Jesus meets us, changes us, speaks to us, shapes us as a community, and transforms us. Years later, John Wesley, the father of the holiness movement from which we, our tradition, is derived, said this about the elements of bread and cup at the communion table. By some mysterious work of grace, the sign, the bread and the cup, links us in a very real way to the thing signified, who is Jesus. The signs, the bread and cup, link us in a very real way to the sign to which they point, who is Jesus. And then Wesley went on with his brother Charles to write 166 worship songs, hymns, that talked about the real presence of Jesus at the table of communion. It's worth noting that not one of those 166 hymns landed in the original hymn book of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Which is really, really odd, I think, because our founder, A.B. Simpson, said this. Roman Catholics teach that in the Lord's Supper, the bread and wine are converted into the actual flesh of Christ. But it would do us no good if we could actually eat the flesh of Christ. It would be profane cannibalism. So, we know where Simpson stands on that one. But if we can receive that which lies back of his flesh, his vital strength into our being, that is all we need. And that is the real substance of the resurrection body. He is the embodiment of life and power. And by the Holy Spirit, he imparts to us that life and power as we worthily receive the sacrament and discern him in it. So where did Luther, Calvin, Wesley, and Simpson get this stuff from? Well, I'm convinced that if you spend a bit of time in 1 Corinthians and you read all the chapters around Paul's talk of the Lord's table, you will realize quite quickly that Paul seems to be very cool with the idea of real presence at the Lord's Supper. He refers to the moment when we partake in the bread and cup as participation in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, how does the real presence of Jesus show up here at the table? How does that happen? I have no idea. No clue. How did Jesus rise from the dead? I have no idea. No clue. And yet, we seem to be pretty good with that. It seems to be just fine to us that Jesus raised from the dead, that he came back to life. We're okay with that crazy miracle. 
But the idea that he could show up in some mysterious and unique and profound way as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't get how those two things don't fit together. I think we need to be comfortable with mystery. Calvin, I'll quote him again, he's got this brilliant line. A trifle mysterious, that the Eucharist is a feast of both absence and presence. And so it always is in the business of faith. And that is just, just that is a profound line. The Eucharist is a feast of both absence and presence. And so it always is in the business of faith. My question is this. Have we marginalized the table? Have we marginalized the table because we potentially don't really understand it? And then my follow-up question is, has these, have these actions hurt us? Has marginalizing the table hurt us as a church? And unfortunately, I think the answer is yes. You see, after this crazy story in Luke 24, the outcome of what happened was mission, outreach, community, love, service, all of the spiritual gifts came out just, a, just soon after this, in the beginning of Acts, we read about it, and the church was birthed, birthed out of the teaching of the Word and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. When we receive the sacraments by faith as gifts from God, we become the sacrament for the world. We become the church of Jesus Christ. It starts with God. We receive God's gift of grace through preaching and the table, and then we respond. We come to know God, and subsequently, we reflect God. Now, every great revolutionary movement within church history has something more than just new ideas. They actually changed the way in which they worshipped. The, the, the actual structure of how they would come together and worship changed. And that usually provided the impetus for the revolution that would take place within that period of time in church history. Now, the Alliance is born of the Reformation movement. And we love to think that we're continuing to be reformational, or that we're continuing to be a movement of God's revolutionary thing of redemption. So is it time that our worship practice changed? Or maybe I should put it this way, is it time that our worship practice deepened to help initiate and grow and sustain and empower this movement of redemption of which we're a part? My primary question when I started to grapple with the meaning of the Lord's table was how can something that has been so central to 2,000 years of church history have been so marginalized, made so small and insignificant in the tradition in which I'm a part? The answer, I think, is because somewhere along the road, we lost sight of the depth and the reality and the grandness of what is going on at the table of our Lord. We made it more about me than it is about Him. We made it more about me than it is about Him meeting with us. And we became uncomfortable with the things that we cannot totally explain. When I first began to puzzle over this passage and all of these ideas, and I was talking this over with my wife Shailene, and Shay looked at me and asked a great practical question. She said, so if all of that's true, then what should I feel when I go forward to partake in the table? It's a great question. Well, we believe that during worship, that during prayer, that during preaching, that we can be dynamically changed because these are places where we can experience the touch of God in our life. That when we come together and sing and worship and pray and hear teaching, yeah, we, we believe that God can meet with us and change us. We approach those things with an expectation that something could happen to us, that Jesus could meet us and transform us. Well, if we come to the table, believing it only to be an act of remembrance and, remor and memorial, believing it only to be a time of inner reflection, then we come expecting nothing. And... Unfortunately, I think, therefore, we likely receive nothing. But if we come with hands and heart, wide open, who knows how the Spirit may act? Who knows how the Spirit may speak and teach and touch and change and transform? When we encounter God, we are always broken and changed for the better. But we must come with expectation. We must 
come with open hands and open heart. And when we begin to realize that this is a moment where Jesus meets with us as a church community, transforming our church community together, we begin to touch, taste, and feel, and experience healing, and compassion, and caring, and encouragement in our midst as the church body. We begin to be empowered and sustained to be the church. This morning I'm asking you to come to your own conclusions about what's going on here at the table. I'm not trying to force anything on you. But for me, and I pray for us, this is more than just little white pieces of bread and small cups of juice. This is more than just inner reflection. This is more than just remembering what Jesus did for us. Though that's certainly an essential part of this, I'm, I'm not trying to belittle that. This is an encounter with the ascended, alive person of Jesus Christ. This is where God meets us and changes, changes us. This is a means of experiencing the grace of God in our lives together as a community. May we, as we partake in the bread and the cup, may we receive power, grace, and presence from Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite those who've been approached to serve communion. You may come forward and, and grab your location along one of these three tables up at the front. And in keeping with the tradition of Paul's words from his letter to the Corinthians, I read to you, I received a tradition from the Lord, which I also handed on to you. On the night on which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. And so we break the bread of life, and this life is the light of the world. After the bread, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do this to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast the death of the Lord until he comes. And so together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. That Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ with us, Christ in us, Christ will come again. In a moment, I will say a prayer, and I will invite you to come forward and receive. And there are servers at the front who are here very intentionally. They are here because this is a gift which you receive. This is a gift of grace which you receive. We do not take gifts, we receive them. But you have to come forward to get it. You have to take that symbolic journey forward to meet with Jesus and then to receive the gift of grace, which is here now in front of us. We do this as a church. We do this as the community of Jesus Christ. We do this because it is here now in these moments that we are formed together to be the very body of Christ. Which means, I've got to say this, if you've got a beef with somebody in this room, you cannot come forward until you have gone to them and straightened that up. And my goodness, if we cannot do that here, as the people of Jesus within this room, we cannot do it anywhere. And so if you are going to come forward, but you know you've got to figure something out with somebody, then I encourage you to do that. Walk around, there is freedom to do it. By you doing it, you give permission for all of us to do it. Along those same lines, if you're aware that there are people in this room, your brothers and sisters in Jesus, who may be hurting, who may have financial needs, who may be physically hurting, or mentally hurting, or emotionally hurting, whatever it is, I would go to them. I would ask them to come forward with you, to receive the elements with them, and then pray together write checks for each other, figure out how it is that we can actually be the community of Jesus Christ. No one should be in this room partaking in this meal and still have needs. It just shouldn't happen. 
by us partaking in this, we are saying we are a community that cares, loves, and encourages each other. We should each be able to look each other in the eye as we come forward and say the ancient greeting, peace be with you, and also with you. That's just a staple of who we are, of our identity. Finally, as you come forward and you receive the bread and the cup, the servers have been instructed to say a specific line to you. So I pause for a moment, look them in the eye, and allow them to say to you, for you and for us. That's what this is all about. For you and for us. Let's pray. O oh God, the risen Christ revealed himself to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Feed us now with the bread of life and break open our hearts. That we may know him not only in the good news of scriptures, but risen and right here in the midst of your holy people. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May you come forward now to receive the gift of grace, mercy, kindness, love, and compassion. Come now.